Ricky? What's up? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me all right? How's his sound? Is his sound okay? Is he centered okay? Uh, yeah, they moved me around already. Do I need to keep moving? Do a little mic check. He's not centered. There you go. Yeah. To put the Bill Simmons picture over him. <laughs> he hates You guys don't understand. He doesn't like playing within the lines. He never has liked playing within the lines. Like... The worst way to do this artistically and creatively, if you want to kill his soul, is to go ahead and move him around a lot into the place where you need him, because we can't. <laughs> you know be, me so well. Because we can't. You know be, me so well. I mean, well, could you want to tell everybody, spiritual guru, to fuck off? I got to be three inches to my left. You can't. You can't do the work. It, it's. <laughs> it reading my mind when he said move to the left. I was like, fuck off. But I was like. Who's this? But I didn't say that. I just said it in my mind. <laughs> but I moved with a smile. Well, you've been doing that one. You've gotten good. <laughs> Moving with a smile for the comforts of others is something. I don't think you've perfected anything the way you've perfected that. Ricky Williams is oh with God. us here on uh, another end of the week excursion. I want to talk to you about an assortment of the things, Ricky. Sort of look back at the week and put a broader context on it. So Jalen Brown seems to have an uncomfortable relationship with Boston, and it's about to get worse because he was quoted in the New York Times. He's a smart person. He's a leader in the Players Association saying, yeah, the racism that exists here in Boston, uh, you know, it's not everybody, but it doesn't feel real good. And then he has an eight turnover performance in a game seven at home, and now people are saying he is not worth the money. He does not deserve 200 and $90 million, the super max that will make him the richest player in the NBA. I know you have to have a lot of thoughts there, so where do you want to start? Tackle whichever part of that you'd prefer to start. Well, you know, I think the idea of is it is this person worth it, uh, you know? And I think from an athlete's perspective, um, you know, I don't want to go down that taboo lane of talking about slavery, but there is some putting a, a value on someone's, on someone's worth. And their ability to execute uh, at the level you think they want to execute. And I think from the athlete's perspective, you know, I, I always talk about fit because if you're in a place and you, you're not really feeling right about it, it's going to affect the way you play. And, and I know money is usually the, the main part of these conversations, but I think eventually athletes have to prior, prioritize quality of life. Well, what did you say last week? Don't go where you're tolerated. Go where you're celebrated. I don't know yeah. how much money. It's $50 million and tw The Celtics can give him more than anybody, Ricky. So what, at what cost, I would ask you? Because it's $50 million, 20, 24, 25, 54 million the next year, 58, 62, 66 million. Nobody else can pay him like that. And if you're Jalen Brown, what do you do? If they're the team that can give it to you, they're the city you could give it to that can give it to you, but you're not comfortable. It doesn't feel like home. Yeah. Well, I think every person, every man has to make a decision of what their values are, uh, whether it's feeling at home, whether it's, am, is he playing this game for the paycheck or is he playing it for something larger? Uh, if you're playing for the paycheck, you just put your head down and you grind. If there's something bigger and you, and you value quality of life and the way you feel about yourself as a man, then sometimes you have to make difficult decisions. Now, it's funny, I feel weird saying that because in our culture, we value money so much. And it's like, at some point, how much are we willing to pay for our, our peace of mind and our happiness? I'm going to read this quote to you from the New York Times, Jalen Brown on experiencing racism with Boston fans. I have, but I pretty much block it all out. It's not the whole Celtic fan base, but it is part of the fan base that exists within the Celtic nation that is problematic. If you have a bad game, they tie it to your personal character. I definitely think that there's a group or an amount within the Celtic nation that is extremely toxic and does not want to see athletes use their platform, or they just want you to play basketball and entertain and go home. And that's a problem to me this is not a shy person this is a thoughtful person this is a person who does not want his voice smothered by the pressures of city and fandom and sports rules you can speak to what kind of muzzling that feels like correct the the inhibition of freedom and it's just it's not even a subtle pressure ricky well it's like i said you know for me it comes back really to the to the dollar amount and, and it's like, you know, part of it is if you, we're dancing monkeys. And I, and, and I mean that literally, but 
that's the reality of it. And we've colluded in this in this situation. And, you know, and I don't see it changing until athletes start to change their, their attitude. Because to me, racist fans, and of course, when you don't play well and they're pissed off, of course, you know, we have these seeds inside of us that we were taught to hide. But when we get pissed off, we can't keep them down anymore. And I think in any market where there's angry white people and their team loses, it just makes sense, you know? It's like you, you can't get mad at the boss. He's going to kick the dog. Knowing what you know now, you're Jalen Brown. What do you think you do? Well, you know, part of it is 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 all hype, you know? I say you, you put your head down and you make a commitment to the team if that's what you want to do, and you and you you transcend it. You know, I think, you know, I feel like my greatest legacy was how I handled all these situations. I mean, that's how we change racism is people have certain ideas about who we are. And then, you know, we act in ways where they have to question that. They have to scratch their head and say, maybe this person is different. Maybe all of them are different. I think as a professional athlete, you know, at least my opinion is you have to embrace that you're a symbol. And being a symbol means no one is going to see you as a human being. But how are you going to approach being a symbol? You think that's your greatest legacy, huh? I do, hundred percent. You know, because it it's the legacy that continues. You know, people can say what they want to say, but as I continue to make choices in my life, where people have to scratch their heads, they have to change the way they can't put me in a box. And if they can't put me in a box, they can't put other men in a box, and they can't put other African American men in a box. What else do you look at as legacy? Because you didn't mention family, Heisman Trophy, football, spiritual adventurer, uh, mar marijuana crusader, be yourself crusader, which is something that you're, be weird and love yourself and embrace yourself. You didn't put any of those in that category. I've never, I've never it's heard all, you say anything about your greatest legacy. It, it's to me, it, they're all connected of just changing people's minds. You know, we don't realize we get so rigid in thinking that life, life is a certain way. And we shut out information that would destroy our belief systems. But to me, the greatest gift I ever had was destroying my stupid ass belief systems. Was there a place above all others that you hated to play that whatever it was, the energies, the hatred, the toxicity, I don't want to be there. This doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel like sports and competition. This feels like divided South stuff. The NFL. <laughs> <laughs> the whole, every, everywhere you went, everywhere. Well, it, 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 it created a difficult situation. It's like the rich white people have to, they have to depend on us. No, and that's like that's not a comfortable position for it, for anyone to be in. You know, especially when they have the when they have the paycheck, it becomes a power struggle. And the the funny thing about it is that is that we accept it. You know, we're like, oh, right, they're paying them. That's how it's supposed to be. You're talking about just the feeling of the league. You're not even talking about stadium to stadium, right? You're talking about your your actual employer. Yeah. Cause that's what that's what sets up the whole the whole dynamic. I think if the if the league and the teams took care of the players, they wouldn't care what the fans are saying. I mean, that's our that's our inter interface, and as long as we feel humanized by the team, all that other stuff doesn't really matter so much. But when it comes to contract negotiations and we become a number, and then they're measuring us, that I think that's when the, I think that's where the trauma that's where the trauma comes in. Do you recall one point above all others in your playing career where, as an organization, you're looking at your organization and you're just wounded, you're hurt because you're like, hey, I'm a human being. Can you please just care for me? Like, commensurate with my value to this particular economy? That's right when I retired. That was a big part of my, my retirement decision is I was – and, and this, there's a moment as an athlete and, you know, and we get to a certain age where our mortality like becomes obvious to us. And then I think inner doubts come up is you know, we realize, damn, if I don't have this, I don't really have shit, you know, and it's scary. And then you realize that the team has all the power and you're in a contract negotiation and you're realizing I'm not going to be able to do this forever. I need something more than just the money. And I was in that position in 2004 and uh, finally, I was finally up for a contract renegotiation almost and we started the, the conversation with the dolphins and their first their first offer you know when i looked at the offer i was like do they not realize that they need me to win games you know and that they put all of this pressure on me and they give me the ball every play and they think i'm supposed to look at this and be like 
okay. You know, and I'm a sensitive guy, so I was butthurt, but that was part of my decision of like, I'll show I'll show you how you do. <laughs> I'll show you I'll show you how well things go. <laughs> you did and you did you did you take me out of this huddle and you watch how many games you lose because you're not handing me the ball every play but uh ricky you're just you're you're counterintuitive so explain to the audience explain to america explain to the globe our relationship with money is so screwed up it is so it is the root of every bad thing that we're doing to the globe and around the globe. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and I hate to—it's not money. Money is not the issue. It's the it's the value we give to money. To me, the whole point of money is happiness. But if you're sacrificing your happiness for money, I think that that's where people get it get it twisted. But you got hurt, right? Because you believe the organization has the responsibility to treat a player as a human being, a valued employee as a human being, not a disposable thing that can be thrown out with insulting insults to the economy. I mean, I, I won't call that a, a human right in the United States. You know, I think that would be sacrilege. But I think if a team wants the player to be happy and they care about the sustainability of the relationship, uh, I think it behooves the team to, to treat they're the players that they value like humans. Speaking of which, one of the more confusing things I've seen recently in politics, Ricky, is the the likes of Lou Holtz or Tommy Tuberville, people who made the entirety of their name on coaching black bodies in a violent sport, uh, then taking on political agendas that are hostile and racist to black people. Uh, when a Tommy Tuberville appears and gets power, from being that kind of politician as a former football coach, your thoughts are what as you watch that? Well, it, it, it breaks my heart because I think, you know, coaches, as you describe them, have a, a great opportunity to really understand the heart and the soul of, of a different person, of African-American. And I think for them not to take that experience with them into politics is a huge, is a huge waste. And if I played for one of those coaches, I'd be heartbroken. Ricky, good talking to you, buddy. Uh, we'll talk to you again next week, all right? Yeah, thanks for having me.